<laughs> okay, well, hello everyone. Now we are getting started. Um, I'm Margot Johnson. I'm a second year MBA student here at Anderson and really <laughs> graduating soon. Um, and really excited to introduce this event, um, the future face of VC. Um, investing in an inclusive startup ecosy ecosystem is something I'm very passionate about. And judging from the attendance today, that passion is shared. Uh, so the theme of this year's Impact Week is transformational leadership for societal change, and something that each of these panelists embody. They all started funds relatively recently because they weren't seeing the change that they needed had to happen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Laurel Mintz, founder and general partner of Fabric VC. Austin Clements, co-founder and managing partner of Slauson & Co. Alicia uh, Humph, CEO and managing partner of Dear Mama Ventures. And our moderator, Ahmed Mirza, an Anderson alum, and investment manager at Techstars. Cool. Take it away. Yeah. All right, great. Yay. Cool. All right. Great, thanks so much, Margot. Uh, and thanks to UCLA Anderson for putting this on. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces here. Uh, as well. So I think to get started, um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about each of you, your funds, and sort of what came about. So start off with Alicia here. Uh, and Alicia has a really interesting story. She started off in the Army. Yeah. And then transitioned over into venture over time. Very curious about your transition and, and what, how that came about. Yes, thank you. I love that you said the word transition because that's one of my favorite words. As an aside, we don't talk about transition enough. Would love to do that one day, but a transition's everything. We're always finding ourselves there. And so, like Ahmed said, my journey here was really different. I started off in the U.S. Army for six years as part of the intelligence community, and that's where I discovered my superpower of building ecosystems. I helped put uh, networks in place in Afghanistan that were built out of empathy and trust. So got out of the military, started working for defense-adjacent funds, decided I didn't want to work for the government anymore um, for many reasons, and pivoted to working with professional athletes. And so selfishly, what I thought was if I can help professional athletes transition, I could help military veterans transition because there's so many similarities between the two. So I ended up um, having an, a, an incredible tragedy in my life. I lost my mother very suddenly to and unexpectedly to domestic violence. And when this happened, I'm a single mom. My youngest daughter was just about one. And I left our whole lives behind in Baltimore where I was working with the Ravens and moved back here to LA. And when I got here, I told my little brothers, I said, look, this moment is gonna change us for the rest of our lives. We will never be the same, but we get to choose right now if this changes us for better or for worse. And so I ended up launching an ed tech company right here at UCLA. Um, so this was the birth of me as an entrepreneur and realized very quickly that as a woman, a woman of color, a single mom, a military veteran, I had every obstacle to overcome instead of opportunity to succeed. And that's really what propelled me um, into VC. So we're Dear Mama VC, and our whole mission is how do we close the ecosystem access gap that exists for underestimated entrepreneurs. And that all came about from a letter that I wrote to my mother after losing her, um, and also inspired by the, ly the lyrics of Tupac. Okay. I'm, now I'm very curious. I have to ask the question. What lyrics from Tupac inspired? Yeah, that? there's many. So and, and can you say it on camera? I can. There's some I won't, but there, I, I make it a point to talk about Tupac every day. Um, so it's Tupac's Dear Mama. So I wrote a letter and I said, Dear Mama, I wholeheartedly believe it's my mission and purpose in life to create the ecosystem where all people can show up vulnerable enough to dream and have the resources to do it. And I saw my handwriting say, Dear Mama, and I went to my car at the cemetery. I put on Tupac's Dear Mama and played it as loud as I could. So this is either like really appropriate or really inappropriate. And you know, listening to Pac talk about, we have money for wars, but can't feed the poor. Facts, you know, we're not meant to survive, it's a setup. And a lot of what he was saying is really the foundation of a lot of the work that we're doing today for our communities. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, let's, let's applaud you. to that, incredible. Um, Austin, love to learn more about you know your background. You know, it seems like you went through the traditional ranks of venture capital uh, and then launched Slauson and Co over the last couple of years. Uh, would love to learn more. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, certainly for the last decade, it's been focused on venture capital exclusively. Um, before that, I think I've probably had more jobs than probably everybody in here combined. Um, you know, just just trying to find out what I wanted to do. And um, I, I did start my career 
Um, in, in, I graduated from Morehouse in Atlanta. I'm from South LA, off, born and raised right off of Slauson, Gardena, and then Ladera Heights. Um, but the, the, uh, I, I went to, I worked in private wealth management for a while, which I um, enjoyed, loved investing, didn't necessarily love the, the environment. Um, and then I ended up starting a business where I was doing web and mobile development. So I loved working with technology. I loved working with the entrepreneurs. Um, to me, it was, these are the most passionate people on the planet, and I love being around that energy. I'm not a, you know, oh, it's Friday, it's almost 5 o'clock, ready to go home kind of guy. I'm like, if I'm not doing something that I'm excited about that inspires me during the day, then, like, what the hell am I there for? So um, I loved working with entrepreneurs. And then in doing that and building technology for a lot of small businesses here, and I had a bunch of clients in New York as well, um, I, 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 I realized that I wanted to be around that for, for the rest of my career. I started reading articles from TechCrunch about, you know, all these people raising millions of dollars. And, and I was like, what is this industry where people are doing what I'm doing? I'm not getting millions of dollars. Like, where is this money coming from? Um, and then learned about venture capital. And it was a combination of, of working with entrepreneurs, working with uh, technology and, and investing, which were the three things that I really loved. And I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the rest of my career. No doubt, no question. Haven't thought anything since that um, a bit over a decade ago. Went to NYU for business school, uh, came back, ended up landing a role at a fund called 10110, which is a data focused fund based out here. Um, and kind of to your point, worked my way up the ranks. Um, uh, during that same time, there was also an initiative called Pledge LA, which was between Annenberg Foundation and uh, the mayor's office that was designed to promote DEI um, amongst the tech community in LA and, and got a bunch of signatories and like over hundreds of signatories as VCs and as of uh, uh, startups. I was fortunate enough to be named chair, founding chair of that organization. I ran it for a couple years. And so my day job, I was a VC. You know, my sort of off time, I did this DEI work uh, for, the, for the city that I love um, and, and realized that I really want to work toward combining those two things a lot more closely. Um, ultimately, that led to what is now Slauson & Co. So as, as a quick context, Slauson & Co., we're a pre-seed and seed stage fund rooted in the idea of economic inclusion. What that means is we want to create more economic opportunities for a wider variety of people than what venture capital has historically touched. Um, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to, to uh, raise a, an inaugural fund of $75 million, got some really great LPs on board, investors in our fund, so, so a bunch of corporates, a bunch of other top tier funds that if you know about venture capital, you know their names, um, and, and a bunch of founders who have built multi-billion dollar companies um, that wanted to invest in what we're doing because they wanted to be connected to those next generation of founder, founders, particularly those that sit outside of Silicon Valley. Um, and so we've been, we've, we've been operating since January 2021 and two years and a quarter in, uh, learned a ton, and, but, but more than anything, excited for the future. It's incredible. Um, yeah, we actually just took in, took in one of your companies uh, from the friends and family cohort. Yeah, Great, they're they're part of the TechStars LA cohort, cohort called uh, Happiest Hours. Yep. So, yeah, really cool combination of technology and uh, kind of servicing community based events and liquor and liquor. <laughs> <laughs> Always good. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah that, that was part of the accelerator that I'm I'm sure I'll get a chance to talk yeah. a little bit more about. Great. So thank you, uh, Laurel. Last but not least. Last but not least. Well, Austin was one of the first people I met in the venture community, and we've been friendly ever since. And I was like, oh, my God, this world is so amazing and inclusive. It is not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're here. Um, I have a, again, totally different background. Um, as of 12 months ago, I had no idea that I was going to be sitting here in front of all of you. I had no idea I was going to be launching a venture fund. The universe had this plan for me. Um, so... Originally, I was a corporate M&A attorney. I also have an MBA in marketing. I did a joint degree at Rutgers. Um, the universe had a different plan. I wasn't going to be a lawyer. I ended up having to step in and run a family business very early on when my dad got sick. Um, so I've been a CEO since 26 in the consumer space. Luckily, he got healthy and stepped back in, and I was able to step away and figure out what my path at that time was, which was marketing. So I've been running an agency called Elevate My Brand for the last almost 15 years. Um, that agency, we've worked with over 300 brands. Over 200 of them have been diverse-led, and 40% of those companies have raised capital. So while I didn't actually know that this was the next iteration of my life, the numbers, by the numbers, it actually makes a ton of sense. 
And so because of that background, the legal side, a lot of the private equity and venture firms had been coming to our agency for years to market them in their portfolio companies. And then one day, Last year, one of the managing partners said, Laurel, we need to talk. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm getting fired. <laughs> you know, it's never a good sign when the boss of the boss of the boss is like, we, we need to have a conversation. But actually, what he wanted to say was, I think you should go raise a fund. I have never seen someone more connected, more mission-driven. You see these deals nine months before we ever see them. And you know how to make these companies winners because 80% of success of consumer brands is marketing. And I was like, yeah, okay, crazy, whatever. And kind of went about my day and it like earwormed me and I couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, maybe I should do this. I, I got to at least do my homework. And that's when I saw the stats that I'm sure you all know, less than 2% of GPs are women and less than 2% and backsliding of all venture funding goes to diverse run businesses. And yet when people that look like us receive funding, we return on average outsized returns. So I, I saw that and I keep telling people it was like I took the blue pill in the matrix and all the zeros and ones unfolded and I was like, well now this is, I have to go do this. I now see the future and the future has to be more equitable. So that's how Fabric VC was born. Uh, Fabric is a $10 million US seed fund uh, only investing in queer, BIPOC and consumer led uh, tech, uh, queer, BIPOC and female led consumer tech with a small carve out for future of healthcare, future of workspace. Um, because if not us, who? If not, now when? It's our job to weave the fabric of the venture future. And that's what we're doing. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to come back to a comment you made, but I'll give a quick intro to myself. Um, so my name is Ahmed Mirza. I'm an investment manager at Techstars Los Angeles. I help run our LA healthcare and space programs. Uh, and those are all out of LA. We run four programs a year. Uh, we invest in 48 companies each year. Uh, we essentially run a cohort-based accelerator 13 weeks at a time. Uh, we intake companies, provide them with pro uh, programming, community, mentorship, and some funding along the way. And our hope is to you know, invest in them so that they're successful in the future. Uh, as it relates to DEI and having impact, uh, we partnered with JP Morgan uh, last year and launched an $80 million fund that is specifically dedicated to investing in underrepresented uh, and underinvested founders. So that's where we are today at Techstars LA, and we have a cohort right now that's uh, in session. So thanks for all of you for joining. And um, you know, on the topic of diversity and impact, you know, Laurel, you had mentioned you know, less than 2% of funding goes to uh, women and underrepresented founders. It seems like that has been the ongoing theme for a few years now. And you know, I guess the question to all of you is, you know, how do we move the needle? Because it seems like there has been a lot of investment in trying to uh, get underrepresented founders up and running. There are now more GPs, solo capitalists involved in allocating capital. But it still seems every year, whenever these reports come out, the numbers are still uh, quite abysmal. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we evangelize and change this? I mean, showing up in rooms like this, right? We have to be loud. Um, I, like I said, wasn't planning on launching a venture fund, but then I saw those numbers and I was like, well, shit, now I can't not do this. Like, I have to go be a part of the change. Um, so I think it's about being loud, having these conversations, showing up for each other, because ultimately, and I'm going to say it, and it's going to be uncomfortable, this is a systemic racism issue, right? The fact that when these companies do receive funding, that they return better returns, and yet the powers that be that are pale, male, and stale, no offense to anyone in the room, are still in control of this ecosystem, just boggles the mind. If their whole job is to make money, they're missing the boat. So it's our job to be loud about why that's wrong and how to make change possible. Yeah. Um, so it's, so I, I, I agree with uh, some of the sentiments there. It also seems that when oftentimes media talks about this, they always, or, or the VCs that are in power or the loudest on Twitter, when they talk about this, they, they relegate this to a pipeline problem. Oh, this is just a pipeline issue. But I think it's much more than that, right? Like, it's not just a pipeline issue, right? It's not just if you have the right connections and you build a community that you're automatically going to find the right entrepreneurs. Any thoughts there, Austin? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it seems to be a pipeline issue, for, but more their issue than, yeah. than, than ours or the, or the broader economy, meaning 
the entrepreneurs, the talent is there. I, I mean, we see it every day. We look at thousands of companies that are led by people that couldn't get in touch with a partner at Name Your Big Silicon Valley VC right. Fund if, if, you know, if they wanted to because they're not connected in those networks. The reality is VC is a very uh, network-driven business in the way that it operates. And, and candidly, I think that it might always be that way um, simply because, you know, these VC firms in most cases are small businesses and small businesses in most cases operate like a lot of entrepreneurs out there. How I usually get people to sort of relate or understand the perspective of VCs in many cases is like when you when you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for a new hire, like, of course, you want the best talent. But the reality is often it ends up coming from somebody who was referred into you. Well, um, they, their, their resume moves to the top of the stack because you trust that person mm -hmm. that said this person is good and you're, and you're kind of, you think about things through that lens. I don't think that that absolves um, all these big uh, venture firms from, from, from like, to, like to, to, to your point, like actually investing or, or considering these types of candidates. Mm -hmm. um, but... I, I, honestly, I look at it as like, this is, this is my opportunity. Um, and, and their blind spots are, are, are our opportunity. And so what, what I really feel like is this is a two-phase approach. And there's the um, ugly, dirty, painful phase, and then there's the like pleasant, happy phase. The ugly, dirty, painful pa phase is people like us have to prove the point that if you do invest in these uh, founders that like they go and continue to produce outsized returns mm -hmm. and and as we consistently do that like there's uh, there, there's a there's a moral argument there's even data and anecdotal stuff but once it starts to become so apparent that that all of the talent in technology or in innovation is not concentrated in one geography amongst one demographic with one specific background then then once that narrative feels stale broadly, then people will start to shift gears. And, and, and we aim to, to prove that. And for as long as there's that opportunity or that disconnect there, I'll continue putting hands in the, uh, our money in the hand, millions of dollars in the hands of people of color and watching them crush it. And, and it's not like, these aren't like gambles. It's like, no, this person has been crushing it long before we right. gave them money. Um, they have phenomenal track records. And so it's just a matter of like, getting people to wake up to the idea that they're they're that they need to be connected to these other networks and it and I'm and sorry. it's just not natural for them calm down Siri <laughs> <laughs> He's apologizing on behalf of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a lot of empathy that Siri yeah yeah so um, incredible insights so you know the notion of and, and this is sort of where my head's at too is connecting you know underrepresented founders who may not have the networks of the traditional Silicon Valley founder. And you know, part of that is our responsibility to build those networks and connections. And you know, I think this comes to you, Alicia. You've done such incredible work with you know, military veterans and you know, obviously connecting you know, former all-stars and athletes uh, to other networks and transition. You know, how, how'd you actually go about building that community and, and transitioning uh, those folks? Yeah, you said that transition word again. Mm -hmm. I think what you said is like, how do we build it? And you just said something said something, Austin, that was so powerful. You said the narrative. We ha it starts with rewriting the narrative, and that's a lot how I built the Bunker Labs community. We took military veterans who are entrepreneurs, and when people oftentimes, unfortunately, see veterans, they think of you know the PTSD person, this like GI Jane, you know this like Rambo type of soldier. They weren't seeing business leaders. They weren't seeing CEOs. They weren't seeing people who were leading companies companies with high rates of return. We have to rewrite the narrative that exists, one, for black and brown women, all of, you know, all of the underestimated entrepreneurs, that we are crushing it. We are generating high levels of return. Also, one of the biggest misconceptions is that when you have um, somebody, I was on a panel one time, and they said, oh, we have somebody from the Innovation Fund, and we have you, dear mama, with the Impact Fund. And I said, I'm actually here to speak about innovation. Yes, I'm serving underestimated entrepreneurs, but we are investing in things like climate and clean energy, food and agriculture, health, the healthcare, energy transition, things that are generating a, a significant impact for our, our communities in terms of revenue, but also impacting the world in a big way. In terms of what you said about pipeline also is this, this narrative that pipeline doesn't exist. So right now, 
In my pipeline alone, I have 2,177 companies, of which consists of four unicorns, of which have raised over $350 million in the last couple months. So if you don't want to invest in this pipeline, like you said, like that's your problem because we have it. It exists. But how are we rewriting the narrative so that when people see funds like ours, they know these are the funds with the pipeline, with the deal flow that are generating the returns. And oh, by the way, they're solving all of the world's largest problems. Yes. So... Uh, first off, I'd love to see your, if you're able to share your pipeline, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Techstars LA invests at the earliest yeah. stages, so that would be phenomenal. Um, second, so how do you sort of, you know, as an investor, how do you balance the, you know, the impetus to, you know, obviously seek you know, outsized returns, which is, you know, the innate to venture capital, right? Yeah. We're all looking towards the power law, right? versus having an impact within a community that maybe, you know, the business, the business that I'm going to invest in may not be, you know, 100x, but right. it may be, you know, slightly less, but I'm okay yeah. with that. I, I, I'm, I'm, so I get this question from LPs and from other folks. Um, the thing to remember about me specifically, I'm an investor first, above all else. So I, I, I find opportunities where I can generate alpha outsized returns. That is what I do. And, and, and if it didn't come in, in, in this area, I would be looking for it in another. That's what drives me, that's my scorecard, is can I beat the hell out of everybody else who's, who I'm gonna be compared to? And, and so this notion that there are like two masters that I have to serve is actually false. The reality is the types of founders that we're backing are the reason yep. why we will outperform. It's not that, it's not that I'm saying that oh, I have to do this impact stuff over here and, and take concessionary returns um, over here. It's like, no, because I am focused on this absolutely underserved market, we talk about it a lot of times. It's like there they're, they're people that assume that we're fishing in this small corner of, of, this, of this pond. And, mm -hmm. I'm, and they're saying, how are you going to find, how are you going to beat everybody else who has the whole entire pond to fish from? I'm saying, screw the pond. We're talking about this lake over here where nobody is looking at all. This is a much more massive opportunity. Everybody's fighting for these fish over here, but what we're doing is going to an entirely different place saying like, this is wide open, totally wide open. MBA students, blue ocean strategy. Like, no. and, and, and this is not about like, like um, um, trying to think about it from a, from a, again, a concessionary period. This is 100% this is aligned with how we, do, how we produce outsized returns. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, Laurel? We have a slightly different approach. We're still fundraising our fund right. one, so we're like the, we're the babies on the block, so we uh, still have a lot to prove. But because I come from the marketing side, we uh, obviously have a similar approach in terms of providing outsized returns, but we also want to create visibility and awareness because that's the platform that we've built prior. So regardless of whether we invest in a port co, um, we do, we have our, so our secret sauce, and I had this epiphany in the bathroom as one usually does. Um, <laughs> we have this listening software on the agency side of our world. And I had this moment uh, where I thought, if I can use that software to pre-vet and de-risk our port codes, I can pick better winners and have better returns. But that report also shows these companies what kind of impact they can have from a marketing perspective. So whether we invest in them or not, they get this report if they get to a certain level of diligence with us. And then on top, so that they can go use that to create better companies, right? So we feel we're having impact with that part of the, of the strategy. And then we also have a huge platform. I have a 30,000 person database that I've built. I have a podcast that's been uh, going on for three or four seasons now with 300 episodes. So we give them opportunities to be in front of those audiences and give them a platform to speak on whether we invest in them or not. So we do have kind of that bifurcated approach on the investment side and also the marketing and visibility side for this very reason. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, for Techstars, we, you know, Techstars LA started uh, about six or seven years ago. Uh, we've graduated six classes through our programs. Uh, we have over 100 companies in our portfolio. And you know, similar to Austin, we don't view it as this versus that, right? Diversity comes very naturally to us, um, and we believe that you know, investing in underrepresented founders, that's where we will find alpha, right? That's where we're going to find the companies that are building, or the founders that are building the next unicorns. Um, and, and that's our goal, is to, is to help them along the way. Um, 
So on this notion of impact investing, where do you see this, what do you see it evolving to or where do you see it going? This is a really powerful question. Um, I think an ever evolving question. I think for me where I'm seeing impact going the most right now is in the energy transition. I, I, I don't think I can get by one, you know, five seconds on LinkedIn without seeing something else popping up about um, energy transition, whether it's battery storage, because we're, we're struggling right now knowing that we're behind to meet our UN's SDGs by 2030 and everyone's talking about you know, electric vehicles and electrifying fleets and all these things, but we don't have the infrastructure for that. And we understand that as a world we want to get away from coal and fossil fuels and everything else, but we don't have the infrastructure that exists. So I think um, for me, I see impact in how do we act truly stabilize this one of my really good friends is the Prince of Uganda, and he says, you know, we have electricity here, we leave our lights on, we run the AC, we do all these things, but in a lot of the world, they can't simply flip on a switch and turn on the lights. And in places where they do, they often have such a depletion in that's the stabilization of their energy, they can't go to school, they can't cook, they're struggling just to have basic things like water, shelter, safety, electricity, really our Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think with that, where impact comes into play is in the... Um, the diversity, the DE and I, and now J portion of that also is when we talk about clean transition and all of these other things, are we truly doing that in a way that serves the communities of the people who need it the most? So that's where I see um, the biggest need for impact. Great. Any other remaining thoughts on where we see it evolving to or what, what's to come? I mean, some, something about it feels like eventually it has to fall to the background in order for it, where it's just expected. Mm -hmm. Like, like table stakes. Table stakes. Yeah. Where, where, you know, I mean, and I guess ultimately that's the goal. I mean, same thing with DEI, where, where you know, like, I, I know I'm going to offend somebody here, but I, I just got to say it. So there's, so the, like, the, there is um, the, uh, <laughs> people used to say, like, if, I read somewhere, someone, a CEO said like, hey, if you have a chief innovation officer, your company's dead. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because like you're, you're saying that like innovation is this thing that somebody's working on and this is a responsibility for it. And, that, and so often the same thing can be said for like a, a DEI officer where like this person is responsible for this part of it. Um, whereas like it, if it's not embedded in the fabric of what you're doing, um, it won't be authentic to when you try to talk to the, these communities. Mm -hmm. And people, we see right through it. We see like, like all these initiatives that pop up that are like, cool, maybe I'll take advantage of it. I don't feel any brand affinity or anything right. like that. Whereas like, we named our firm Slauson because it's like, this is a South LA focus fund. Like anybody that comes from the neighborhood that I come from, like this firm was clearly built for me. You know, like that's, that's how people view it. Because they 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 have some um, they have some ties to the brand and un, an understanding of the values of it, and I guess I feel like eventually we'll get to a place where it sits in the back, where it has to sit in the background in order for it to feel authentic to people that aren't dumb, like to people that like they they get it, like they get whether it's a priority is of yours or not. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said I freaking hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hope so. And maybe that's aspirational. Maybe we have a ways to go before we, we get there. I, I think it's, it's, it's an astute observation. And I also think it is, there is certain, it is a lagging indicator, right? Mm -hmm. So the current generation, and you know, meaning millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, they have grown up in a much more global economy and environment. They are accustomed to working across communities, working across groups. And you know, at least I don't foresee issues uh, of diversity and inclusion uh, plaguing those generations as it has uh, historically previous generations. Um, okay, so on, on the investing bit, um, how do you, you know, as it relates to having impact and, and diversity, how do you kind of eliminate unconscious bias in your investment process? Or how do you, how do you sort of mitigate for that? I mean, we're 100% invested in this category, so it's innate in our approach. So I wouldn't say that 
I, it's just there for us. And I've, it feels like it's like that for everyone on the panel. I, I mean, I, I would argue that I'm as biased as other VCs. I'm just biased in a different in direction. Different <laughs> direction. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, I'm trying to tip the scale, balance the scales. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, like, I don't know that you uh, eliminate, bias is a human nature thing. Of course. Right? And like, I, I often give the example of like, you know, I went to Morehouse. If, if I see a founder that went to Morehouse or a Spelman or another historically black college, I, I, I associate that with a number of things. You know, this is a high achieving, high expectation person who's well networked and, and probably, you know, all these things that come along with what happens when somebody who went to Stanford hears about somebody who went to Stanford. Right. And so for, for them, I don't expect them to, to feel the same way about Morehouse that I do. They didn't go there. And so I don't, I don't even necessarily knock them for, for overlooking the, this, this type of founder. That's not their life experience. Um, but I do view it as my opportunity. And, you know, we have this thing. I think it's the first thing on our website. It literally says, like, your lived experience is your competitive advantage. Mm. That, is what, that is how we win. We win by leaning into who we are and authentically going after the opportunities that we know that are out there. And anybody else who tries to compete... I'm not going to beat Sequoia for a deal in Silicon Valley for an ex-Googler who went to Stanford and all that. Talk to me about, you know, a woman coming up in South L.A., a black woman yeah. coming up in South L.A., all day, all night, I'll, I'll, I'll beat them on deals. Like, that, this is what I know, this is what, what I do. And so, and, and, and I'll bet on that category while they, while they totally own that lane over here and we can both coexist. And also, the last thing I'll say on this is I feel like the disconnect in venture capital is at the very earliest stage where we're investing. Yeah. Um, after these companies have the opportunity to prove themselves, they deliver. And then other Silicon Valley starts to pay attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the capital will go and be allocated to where them that way. So the market disconnect is largely at the very earliest stages, which is where we play and where I see the biggest opportunity. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think also investing at the stage that we invest at, so much of it is driven on those personal relationships, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How well do you... Are, are you able as an investor to form a bond with the founder, right? I, I yep. think there's this notion in, in media and entertainment that, you know, you have to act all hard as an investor and that you're, you know, take my terms, ratchet clauses, you know, and, and I need 50% of your company. The reality is that's not it. Right, it's not the WeWork drama. It's not you know the um, Hulu episode on Elizabeth Holmes or Theranos. I can attest that as an early stage investor, I am working for my founders day in and day out, and I'm making introductions to them to you know the largest companies in the world, and I will bend over backwards to do that because I care about them uh, and I care about their success, and I I, I want to treat them with empathy and. Um, I guess that's a, that's a question for, for you, Alicia, is, you know, how do you think about relationship building and, and sort of that, that sentiment of, you know, when you invest, you, you know, are you, are you building relationships? Are you focused on the deal? You know? Yes, yeah, so we said one of my other favorite words, which is empathy. And I think Just empathy... nailing all of yeah, the words here. Empathy is certainly a superpower, and it's how we like to go into a lot of the decisions we make. And even when you talked about earlier about, you know, differentiation, we actually do win deals that are, you know, from the culture, but also, you know, comparable or from Andreessen Horowitz and mm -hmm. Sequoia Capitals and those of the world. And that just comes down to our values. I think we lead with our core values in everything that we do. We seek to build relationships relationships. Um, it's the most important. We're in the relationship building business. I think founders can tell right away, like you said, for anybody who's not dumb, you can see through this. Founders can tell right away when you're truly invested in them, when you're inspired and you want to help them make a difference. And when you're, you're helping them problem solve to get to the next steps. And mm -hmm. one of the things we look for that's really important that's in our investment thesis is we look for founders with rare grit, this do or die mentality, and which is another Tupac lyric, but who have survived against all odds. Because those founders, what we found time and time again have overperformed and overachieved and will be successful because this isn't easy. So I think um, the relationship building is key. And on that side too is this is where the professional athletes and the family offices come in. So a lot of our deal flow that we do get is oftentimes closed with preferred terms that come in through our family office network or our family office network. And the reason we have the ability to have these deals is oftentimes people will see an athlete like Baron Davis who went here 
And they'll say, can you send this deal to Baron? We really want to have Baron on our cap table. Well, what's in it for him? And I feel like so oftentimes athletes are really preyed upon in a way that's unfair for them where they see an athlete, whether it's you know on the CPG side or something else, and they'll say, we want you to put this on your Instagram or do something. And it's like, is that a good values fit for the athlete? Is that going to generate them any return? Are you just seeing them you know, based off their name, image, and likeness and not giving them an opportunity to have ownership and to build a brand and a business for themselves? And so by just purely building relationships with athletes and giving them a platform, I've been able to have access to some of these deals and also giving them opportunities that they might not have ordinarily had. Yeah, that's great. Um, Yeah, I I really appreciate that notion of, you know, sort of changing the face of VC, of uh, moving it away from transactions to relationships. I think that is so critical and it's much needed, not only at the early stage, but um, throughout the entire investing uh, ecosystem and journey. Um, Okay, so yesterday, Phil Knight, billionaire co-founder of Nike, announced that he's investing $400 million in a new fund uh, called the 1803 Fund. It's going to be dedicated to rebuilding a historically black neighborhood in Portland uh, called Albina. And question for the group here is, do we need more initiatives like this? Do we need more Phil Knights, or are there concerns when a billionaire investor comes in and puts up such a large sum of money to, quote unquote, rebuild a community. I mean, this is more your counter, but I would say say it has to not be performative, right? Again, the authenticity will shine through if something is real or if this is, you know, a dastardly, underhanded approach to something else that we don't know about. Um, Like, I don't know if you guys watched the show Woke, the second season where they put the uh, 5G in the sneakers and don't tell anyone, like, is this going to be like that? What's happening? Um, So I think it just, we just see how it unfolds and make sure that the, that it's pure in its heart and how they're going to actually execute on that. Because, I mean, look, I'm very clear what I look like and the privilege that I come from, so I have to be very conscious of that same approach and make sure that I don't come across performative, that my board is diverse in every way possible, um, and I think it's the same thing here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Austin, Alicia, any thoughts? I, I think for, the yes, to what you're saying, um, I think it depends on, so several years ago, and I don't know how many people know this, but Steve Ballmer committed Mm -hmm. a significant similar amount of capital to supporting diverse fund managers. And one of the first things he said at a breakfast with a few of us was, I don't necessarily want this to be tied to my name. I don't want this to become, you know, the Steve Ballmer press. I want it to go to the people that matter the most who have the access to the deal flow, who are tied into the communities who can make a difference. I think what Phil is doing in Portland is amazing. And how do we do that really for every city across the country? But are we doing it in a way that's building up this city near Portland that's going to keep the community there? Or is this going to do what we see in so many cities where it's driving out the people who've had their lives there? Um, Similarly, there are conversations about, you know, this large infrastructure project that was going to build hyperloops and vertical farms through Inglewood. And it's like, do we understand what putting freeways through these cities did historically to our neighborhoods and communities? So I think as long as it comes from the lens of truly building the community there for the people, by the people, to enrich that community for better, great, if it stays there. I mean, my take on it is, I, I agree with what these brilliant women said. There's also a component of um, we, we have to obviously think about how much influence, um, you know, certain people have really like very like obscenely wealthy people have on um, everything that like infrastructure of this country. Right? right. And and if we're basically depending on people like Balmer's guy, Balmer's great. I think he's solid. I think he has a good heart. I think he's done a lot of work to your point where he sits behind the scenes and does it. But, but conceptually, um, what we're saying is, you know, we have, let's call it, we live in a democracy, but really there's a thousand people who are billionaires who, who have total outsized influence on what gets done in this, in this country. And, um, it's a capitalist society and money talks. And, right. and so to me, it begs the question of who are these people that are shaping the future of this country? And, and, and to me, um, there's two approaches you can do. One is like a, a complete revolution and, <laughs> and, and civil war maybe, <laughs> or like, 
or, or political two, comments aside, <laughs> we, we may have been close to that. You know, <laughs> it's <something>. fair. <laughs> um, or, or two, um, you you create pathways and open up doors so that if there are going to be influential people shaping this country, let's at least be represented in those discussions or in that opportunity. And if most of these people got this kind of wealth, starting with venture back companies, like this has an outsized influence on this country and how the wealth is created in this country. Mm-hmm. If, if, if we play out how, what these statistics bear of 2% going to women, less than 5% going to all people of color, yep. like how does that play out over time if we don't correct that? It's, 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 it's massive impact on, on the influence of how the, com- how the country is built going forward. Mm-hmm. So to me, like it's more than just like, let's get a few people rich and yeah, we all, we all win. It's like, no, this is shaping the future of how Absolutely. we operate and the values and where philanthropic dollars get allocated and where initiatives like this get allocated. He picked some random city in, in the US and said, this is gonna be a, probably one of the most important cities in the next century. Right. And made it happen. You know, let's like like we need people that are going to say, well, I care a whole lot about homelessness or I care a whole lot about, you know, whatever other initiative or, or community. And then and wants to uplift that, but be in the position to be able to actually execute against that. Yeah. More so about that's systemic change. More yeah. about systemic Absolutely. change. Through Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of this comes down to. Right. Is advocacy, authenticity. Uh, the transparency of what you're doing and then yeah. the accountability, yes. right? Yes. Being yes. accountable and, and actually, you know, following through on, on what you promise to do. Um, so quick fire round. So uh, we have one minute remaining. Um, why LA? We'll start with Laurel. Oh, this is, I mean, we're LA, oh, gee. I'm literally <laughs> Laurel from Laurel Canyon. My dad was a hippie in the 60s. He lived in the commune. And then I came along and was like, I'm going to be alert. And he was like, oh, shit, OK. Um, so I mean, this is where I'm born and bred. I'm, okay. I'm here. I'm diehard LA. Fantastic. So, yeah, same, same. Born and bred here. This is, uh, this is, this is home. I, I think I love the diversity of the city. I love that there's so many different communities represented. I think it's the best place on the planet to start a consumer company because you can uh, get responses from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, and and uh, and it's cool as hell. So, yeah. No. And finally beautiful yeah. again. And finally the sunshine. Beautiful again. Yeah. <laughs> and then one last lyric to live and die, die in LA. LA. It's, it's a place to be. There we go. Got to be it to show it. Everybody wants us. I think that's where we have to end it. So, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Um, VCs who can. Who can sing? That, 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 I, I, I don't know if that was. <laughs> that could be another panel. That could be another panel. Um, at this point, I'd love to open it to all of you for Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll start there. Okay, thank you. Hi, Maggie Delmas. I'm the uh, faculty director of the Center for Impact. Thank you to all of you for for coming. So we have uh, a social impact investing fund at uh, the Anderson School, and we are training our students to be uh, social impact investors. And so my question to you is, uh, besides singing, uh, what are the skills that you think are missing you know, in the workforce and things that we could you know, kind of give our students to have an edge in this industry? Um, Wow, I get this question a lot because I've mentored a lot of um, people on the agency side and I see so many people that have the desire but never ask the question. So I always try and make time for people in rooms like this who want my time to kind of mentor and bring them along and make connections because you never know when you're going to be hiring and then you have a personal contact with that person. So I think the skill set is not just wanting to do it, but how are you showing up? How are you creating informational interviews with people like us on the panel who might be giving you a job in the future so that you're not just sitting here hoping and wanting, but you're actually taking action? Um, I, 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 first of all, I have to give a, a, a big shout out to you and the program and what you built here. I, 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 think, I think it's amazing. We're, Slauson and Co., we're the beneficiaries of uh, UCLA Consulting Corp. Um, project. Uh, shout out to Jess Rodriguez, who uh, graduated from here last year and, and, and sort of led that project on our side. Um, uh, in terms of skill sets, uh, usually when I talk to business school students uh, and, and, I, and I say directly, like, my, my one piece of advice is don't be afraid to, to go deep into one thing. I think, I mean, I went to B school. I feel like a lot of students there 
um, optimize for optionality, meaning they're, they're like, why did you take this role? Because it could lead to 10 different other roles, and, why, and then in one of those roles, and I'll could do, choose for all those things. Um, I love the people that are willing to say, this is what I want to do. I want to go deep into this. And, and I have the sort of passion and desire and, and intellectual curiosity of, of that could probably fill up a room, but it's all being focused on this one particular thing. Um, and, and I don't think that uh, in, in, in venture, there's so many things. It's obviously always evolving and you have to think ahead of the curve um, in order to be successful. And so there, you won't, there's no lack of intellectual stimulation for this job, but, but uh, the number of people that like really want to do this and demonstrate it, I think, are, are, is actually much smaller than the number of people who say, yeah, venture capital is really interesting. Could be an interesting next step. Right. And I would say permission to fail. Like, please give your students permission to fail. Students, please give yourselves permission to fail. This is, it's the most important thing. I think UCLA especially is such a competitive campus. And when we're constantly focusing on the win or being great, we miss all the magic that happens right. in the failure. And my mom used to always say to me growing up, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. And it wasn't until recently I thought she was giving me permission to pursue my dreams. It's only recently where I realized she was giving me permission to fail. And in that failure, you realize there's so much magic that happens around you. Yeah. And... To add to, I, I completely echo all of these sentiments. I think the, the last thing I would add is build bridges, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those bridges may lead to nowhere, and that's perfectly okay. <laughs> that, that is part of the process, that right? It, it, it lean into that failure, learn from it, and build a better bridge. So, yeah. Next question. Hi, thanks a lot for all the insight. Uh, great to be here. My name is Camilo. I'm a Latin founder here in LA. Um, there's impact and there's real impact. And I think uh, real impact takes time to build. Um, there's some companies in the past, and you touched a little bit on this, on the returns and how fast you're expecting this as an investor. Uh, for those companies that are in the climate era uh, that need real solutions that will you know, lead to those real impact, uh, what do you think has been missing for that shift of investors in going in and taking higher risk um, not only on the software side, but also on the hardware side. Not my area. So one of the biggest, I think, barriers that we're seeing in the climate tech space is policy, having mm -hmm. access to policy. So most entrepreneurs aren't in these, like you were saying, we're not at the table when we're saying who's shaping the future of our cities, our country, you know, our world. So one, just like understanding policy and how that impacts the success of an investment. I think two, just nature of having subject matter experts in the space. While climate and clean energy has been a hot topic for a long time in many circles, it's only recently become something that's very hot. I hate to say that in the VC space, and a lot of VCs are even wondering now, like, is this something that's going to, you know, be out in the next couple of years, sadly. So I think one is like, the desire, the subject matter expertise, the um, ability to understand the policy and law making and changing side, and then just making it simple for people to understand. If it's technology that like somebody just pitched me on a company where it's taking seaweed from uh, somewhere in the Caribbean and bringing it here and making leather goods that's going to like now be in a Ferrari, I was like, that sounds so great, but I don't even understand the supply chain. Like I'm so confused, but good luck to you. So making it easy for us to understand. Next question. Uh, in the back. The, in the back. He had his hand up. Strong hand over there. Strong hand. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I like recently read something that it was like a black woman who invented, or yeah, she invented something with lasers that cured cancer in mice. But the problem is that she couldn't get like funding mm. for like the huge cost of what she needs to do to get it um, approved for human trials, which was like, you know, in the mil hundreds of millions. And, um, you know, people were saying like, she's curing cancer. Like, how is that not good enough to get funding? Um, and, you know, part of it is like, okay, the, un the you know, like black um, innovators are just not, don't have the access and networks to get that funding. But then, um, you know, I descended into the comment section and there was some um, part, like some people were saying that, you know, big pharma 
doesn't want to, like, you know, want people to cure cancer. Um, so, you know, that's why, like, you know, there's a lot of money already being generated through, you know, um, what do you call the, the medicines that treat cancer that, you know, there's not incentive. So I was just wondering, like, without getting too paranoid, but, like, do you guys ever... Um, encounter like, you know, when you're funding these innovations that could be very disruptive of what's currently already profitable, like, you know, how you're talking about like client things for energy transitions and stuff. Like, do you ever come across like big oil or like these big pharma or something that um, try to kind of like, you know, like crush, crush what you guys are trying to elevate or something? Um. More, much more commonly, people, big companies are dismissive of, of what's up next. Um, there's a popular book, Clayton Christensen, The Innovator's Dilemma, where he, we've probably all heard the term like disrupt um, in terms of technology, like this technology is disrupting something, has actually a very specific definition and it's and it, and it was Clayton Christensen that that defined it in that book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's really about how big companies have are are usually in a position where they're um, serving big customers and they're making a lot of money and they're doing just fine. And then the the thing that actually out outputs them is is usually starts out as a product that's definitively worse, but it but it super serves like one subset of their customers, of this big company's customers, really, really well. And, and, and it's like, and so this big company is like, why, I don't care about that contract, I don't care about that customer, it's not making me money. And, and while this company is saying like, I'm focused only on this little tiny company, and I'm getting better and better and better and better and better and better, and, it, and this company cannot say, it, it literally doesn't make sense for them to say, well, I'm gonna stop serving these big customers that are making me tons of money to go serve this thing that's, that's emerging. So they're kind of paralyzed in a lot of ways. And then the small company ends up sort of disrupting is, is the, their, their market or their industry because, um, because they were more or less ignored. Um, that is, pattern is substantially more common than like what we see of like from, from large companies like saying I'm trying to crush crush this company, uh, in my view, maybe it's different, more different in, in healthcare, um, specifically pharma. Um, I, I could imagine that that could be the case, not my sort of area of expertise. Uh, but 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 when we think about, like I've I've never asked a, a founder, you know, well, what do you do if Google comes and does this? Mm -hmm. Like it's a stupid question because like of course they have enough capital to do anything, but will they care about it enough or are they paying attention to this or is this a very specific insight that you believe that may be wrong? Because usually those are the things we're betting on. Or sometimes yeah. you'll see like an M&A activity, like, well, they'll, they'll go in and they'll just scoop up that company. That's yes. the other yeah. side of it. I would say that's probably more typical. Yeah. So, and, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, just like to what you said, though, because I don't want this to get missed due to the topic of this panel, is black women get less oh, than 1% yes. <laughs> of all funding, period. Just 1%. So that doesn't surprise me. And, and yes, we are curing cancer. That is, for all the investors in the room or potential investors, that is the opportunity. You can invest at the earliest stage in these founders who are solving the world's biggest problems, who also represent the world's biggest revenue generators. We're missing it. So that is what I hear when I, when I hear your story there. Also, if there's any angel investors in the room, the biggest, when we talk about access, the gap that exists is in the friends and family round that exists for most underestimated entrepreneurs. We oftentimes don't have our Ivy League network to go out to our friends and family and, and dads, you know, lacrosse buddies to raise us <laughs> millions of dollars with one phone call. I've seen it. I've been in a room where this has happened. I'm like on the golf course, like, wow, can I have some money? Like, <laughs> so we don't have access to that, unfortunately. And that is the gap that we're working on closing, but also to the other end, that is the opportunity that exists. Yeah, that's yeah, why they call it an access class, not an asset class. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely right. And, and that's why the work that we're all doing is so important, is we are at the grassroots level of building community, of building networks, and trying to find you know, these underrepresented founders that you know, historically have been overlooked. There was a question. One more question. He's, he's, he's had, had his hand, hand, hand yeah. for a while. Yeah. 
You gotta have a strong hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm absorbing. I'm an Inglewood kid, born and raised. That's where I live. So awesome. Awesome. There we go. Shocked. I love um, it. Up to no good. <laughs> Former government, I'm a diplomat. I was a human rights officer in Haiti post-quake in 2010, focused on getting grant money to organizations that were trying to rebuild. So in crisis, there's opportunity. Post-COVID, so much attention went to recognizing the fact that there, and there's an unbelievable source of talent in these communities that should be tapped, right? Question I have for you guys, because I deal with it now, and it's why I came to B-School. I'm an investment advisor, and I saw so many businesses trying to find ways to get to capital who could not because they were nowhere near the bridge to be able to understand this space, right? I'm in my last year of B-School across town, and it took someone who was an alum to tell me that this panel was even happening. I never heard about diversity and impact investment in LA with communities of color. I am an intern at Sorensen, and I just met this space at SoCap. So I'm just curious about this conversation of that bridge that's missing, yeah. right? There's so much untapped potential that doesn't even realize there's the possibility to be able to find people at the ground floor working. So how, based on your all's experience, are we able to move the construction pylon such that that bridge is really being constructed. Yeah. Sorry. No, I love this question. This is part of my mission because I'm a I'm new personally in this space. So what I've done is used my platform that I built prior to this to educate and empower. So we're doing a series, for example, on Fabric's Instagram channel called the ABCs of Venture to help educate and empower other people. A lot of the conversations that I have with prospective LPs are people who have no experience in venture and I have to have five, six, seven conversations with them to educate them around this as an asset class. That's the uphill journey that I've chosen to have that kind of impact because I know that the people that are going to have really positive impact with their dollars long term may not even have access to it right now. So that's my, my uh, mission and alignment with impact is how do I personally educate and empower through the platforms that I've built. So share all of this. That's, how, that's what I would say. Is like Everyone needs to go on all of our channels, follow all of our channels, share the content, make sure that people within your networks that don't know about this world now know. Go ahead. Uh, I, I would say you know, one thing that we're doing, actually to Alicia's point, um, is, was around the friends and family round uh, where, where that's such a huge uh, gap in, in terms of like getting people an entryway into this world, understanding the language, the terminology, the players who, who, who you should get to know and, and even how to position your business to, to where you can attract capital. Um, so aside from our fund, uh, we started an accelerator called Friends and Family, uh, where we provide 12 weeks. Uh, it's a 12 week program of education around venture capital and um, also give $25,000 in non-dilutive capital. So this is straight philanthropic dollars come in the door from donors like Howard Schultz, who's the CEO of Starbucks, um, Ron Conway, Jim Getz, who's run Sequoia. Um, they, they put dollars into this that just flow straight back out to the 20 companies that we select. Um, and, and, and the reason why we created that program is even as a venture fund, a lot of times the people that are even ready for a pre-seed round did already raise this friends and family capital that helped them get a product in market or helped them do that. And so, you know, our goal is to try to put even more capital into these friends and family rounds um, as best as we can. So we're all constantly thinking about ways to, to, to uh, boost that. But um, yeah, I, I, all in all, we want to act as a conduit, as a bridge to your point between the communities that we aim to serve and Silicon Valley where, um, candidly, I, 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 there, we've come across many people in Silicon Valley that want to connect and honestly don't know how. Yeah. And, and, and so like, again, Howard Schultz, Jim Getz, Ron Conway, these are people at the top of the game. And these people are like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to give money directly to these. I'm on board. We raised $500,000 from four people basically. And, 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 and so I think that uh, creating these bridges to, your, to the word that you use is just critically important on both sides. And I just want to add to that because this is 
why it's so important, the work that you are doing with Slauson and & Co and where it's located, we have to see it to exist. Right. And so a silly story, Ray Lewis, NFL Hall of Famer, is a partner. And one of the things, he tells a story where, you know, his mom always told him growing up, you know, you're not allowed to go to white folks' house. Mm -hmm. And so one day he was playing football with one of his friends and the mom was like, come inside, come for dinner, you know, wash your hands. And he sat there at dinner and they had the table set, napkin on the table and everything else. So he doesn't tell his mom, but he goes home and he's at his house. And what does he do before dinner? He sets the table. He puts a napkin on his lap. He sets, you know, his fork and his knife. And he says his mom comes up behind him and is like, you've been to white folks' house. <laughs> and he was like, did you know but like also why don't why can't we do things that way and he said it was that spark in his mind where he said if they're doing things differently like that what else are they doing what else do they have access to and so his whole thing that he says often is how do we spark imagination and I think that, you know, the importance of having these funds in the community is if we're getting money and we take that success and that money and we go live in Silicon Valley or in these other neighborhoods, people who are in those neighborhoods never see that it's possible. So we need to have more Funds like Slauson & Co. who are there. We need to have more people who are successful who are in their communities. We need to have more um, philanthropists who look like the neighborhoods are serving who are there doing the good work so people can say, okay, because they did it, I can too. Yeah. Yeah. As a, one last thing. I, I mean, that is, is so important um, that people see that. I mean, like, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a trustee for Knight Foundation in, in Miami. Does phenomenal work, one of the largest foundations, in, private foundations in the country, I show up to board meetings dressed like this. I show up because I want both sides to see. I want people that are only around other people that are billionaires and control billions of dollars that, that when I show up and I, and I articulate what, you know, my perspective and things like that, people respect it. And they look at the next person who's dressed like this and say, oh, you know, like I'm not gonna dismiss that person. I also show up so that when people see a, any, a, any kind of pictures of our board or anything like that, that, that the people from my community say like, Austin's rocking a Morehouse sweater in the middle of, you know, in, in front of all these people, that all these important people, um, and, and, it, and it means something to have that representation there. Like, to your point, it's, it's so important. And, and you can't understate about what it means to bring your full self to all these rooms. Yeah. Um, I think the last point here I'll add is, you know, for bridge building in Los Angeles, LA is a city like no other. It is a, is a city that's constructed of 60 different towns stitched together. <laughs> and this is, you know, there are different pockets, right? Like OC has its own stuff going on. <laughs> Pasadena has its own stuff going on. The west side of LA has stuff going on. And, you know, part of what we're trying to do at Techstars LA is, is to bring all of that together. Right, so we've hosted events with numerous organizations, um, you know, whether it's Black VC, whether it's Slauson and Co. We're trying to build a community in downtown Culver City to make people aware of the work we're doing. Um, I personally take time out of my day to do out office hours with founders, uh, specifically guiding them on their story and, and their pitch deck and how to optimize it uh, for for fundraising and, and other capital needs. Well, thank you. That was the <laughs>